You are listening to The Loop Podcast, a project in plastic surgery innovation. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to The Loop Podcast. I'm Dr. Casey Sheck, and I have with me today Dr. Morgan Martin. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. Today's episode is a resident-guided in-service review. This is the little brother to the anxiously awaited craniofacial topic that Dr. Martin helped all of you crush earlier, but here it comes cleft lip and palate. Keep in mind that this is a supplementary episode and not meant to be a comprehensive review. This is a wildly complicated topic, and we're just here to help go over a few high yield topics and get you a few extra points. Also, make sure and take a look at our YouTube channel. Our medical school colleagues here at The Loop have put together amazing graphs, charts, and photos from high yield articles and some of our medical illustrator friends to help you learn visually as well. So first, I think you have to compartmentalize that there are two very different groups. There is cleft lip with or without cleft palate and then cleft palate alone. So in the US, cleft lip plus cleft palate, there's a prevalence of one in 700. It is more common than cleft palate alone at one in 1500. Cleft lip and palate has a male predilection at two to one versus cleft palate alone. There is a female predilection at three to two. Cleft lip and palate has an ethnic distribution of Asia to Caucasian to African at 4 to 2 to 1. No difference in cleft palate alone. Cleft lip and palate is less syndromic at 15% versus 50% for patients with cleft palate alone. You should also review the different appearances of all of the following entities. So cleft lip and palate, unilateral or bilateral, complete or incomplete. Cleft palate alone, unilateral, bilateral, complete and incomplete. Cleft lip alone, unilateral, bilateral, complete and incomplete. So Casey, let's talk about the always loved embryology. Ah, embryology, everybody loves it. So during the fourth week of embryogenesis, five processes are formed. There's the frontonasal prominence, paired mandibular processes, and paired maxillary prominences. The frontonasal process buds bilateral, medial, and lateral nasal processes where the formal frontonasal process leads to formation of the forehead, the root of the nose, and nasal bridge, the lateral nasal process will form the nasal ala, while the medial nasal processes will form the nasal tip, columella, philtrum, and the premaxilla, while fusion of the two medial nasal processes create the nasal septum. During weeks six through eight, you have fusion of medial nasal processes with each other, And it's during that time that failure of fusion leads to a cleft lip. It should be known that specifically, a median cleft lip results from failed fusion of the medial nasal prominences. A unilateral cleft lip results from failed fusion of the medial nasal prominence with the maxillary prominence on that side. And cleft of the primary palate is produced by a failure of fusion of the medial and lateral palatine processes. So next, when you are asked about risk of having a child with cleft lip and palate, you need to remember some numbers. These are for non-syndromic clefting and familial patterns. Isolated cleft lip in a sibling gives you a 2.5% chance for a subsequent child with cleft lip. Unilateral cleft lip plus cleft palate sibling is a 4.2%, two siblings gives you 10% risk, and a parent and a sibling is a 17% risk. These are for non-syndromic inheritance. Casey, tell me about the two most common syndromes associated with cleft lip and palate. So the most common syndrome associated with cleft lip plus or minus palate is Van der Wood syndrome. This is passed on through autosomal dominant inheritance pattern with incomplete penetrance. It's caused by an IRF6 mutation. Lip pits are the hallmark of this syndrome. You're gonna get lip pits in these patients and then also 80% of Vanderwood syndrome patients have small teeth or hypodontia. The second most common syndrome to be associated with cleft lip plus or minus palate after Vanderwood's is charge syndrome. This is from a mutation in the CHD7 gene 20% of patients with CHARGE syndrome have a cleft lip plus or minus palate. Once again, while this was discussed in the amazing craniofacial review by Dr. Martin and Dr. Zahidi, a quick reminder, CHARGE, the acronym CHARGE stands for 
colobomas of the eye, C for colobomas, H for heart defects, A for atresia of the nasal coena, R for retardation of growth, G for genital and urinary abnormalities, E for ear deafness. What are some other syndromes that you may see come up when discussing cleft lip, cleft lip plus or minus palate, or isolated cleft palate? Kalman syndrome is characterized by hypogonadotropic hypogonadism with anosmia, cleft lip and or palate, renal agenesis or aplasia, and dental defects. This is caused by mutation in FGFR1. Next is velocardiofacial syndrome. Remember, we talked about this in the craniofacial episode. It is caused by 22Q11.2 deletion and is also called DeGeorge syndrome when associated with immune issues or catch-22. You see a submucosal cleft, hypotonia, cardiac anomalies, hypoparathyroidism, immune deficiencies as well. These patients have a long face, wide nose, small ears, and decreased muscle tone. They are also more likely to have worse speech outcomes and VPI secondary to hypotonia. Next, let's talk about trisomy 13, or Patau. These patients have cleft palate, CNS disorders, microcephaly, polydactyly, rocker bottom feet, urogenital defects, and cardiac anomalies. So when talking about cleft palates, you should understand the Vogue classification to know the extent of clefts. Casey, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, I'd love to talk about it. So the Vogue classification for cleft palates you have to understand it goes from posterior to anterior. So a VO class 1 is an incomplete cleft of the soft palate. A VO class 2 is hard and soft, but secondary palate only. So it's posterior to the incisive foramen. Uh, class 3 is a complete unilateral cleft lip and palate, including the alveolus. And then a class 4 is complete bilateral cleft lip and palate. When thinking about cleft palate, understanding that the muscles involved will help you answer some questions. So, the way I think about that is muscles first. First, the most important muscle is the levator veli palatini. I immediately think that it elevates, levator elevates the vellum or the soft palate. When a cleft palate is formed, the levator is no longer a sling, but instead anteriorly inserted on the soft palate on either sides inappropriately. The levator veli palatini is the most important muscle fiber during cleft palate repair to re relocate to the appropriate posterior location to allow adequate soft palate motion and elevation. Next is the tensor veli palatini. It's the next muscle we want to talk about. This tenses, as in the name, the palate and helps open the eustachian tubes. Not exactly true but it's how I remember it and it's the questions they'll ask. So because this is malpositioned, you don't open the eustachian tubes. This results in 90% of cleft palate patients having middle ear effusions, all because the tensor is not properly located. The tensor is the only non-vagus innervated muscle that we'll talk about of the cleft palates as well. Now this is not a good time or space to go through the intricacies of the anatomy of cleft lip and palate but we will touch on a few high yield issues as we go through other topics. So let's talk about repairing the clefts and the sequence. First thing to know is this is the ideal sequence. You may be asked what to do for an adopted child or someone who has had no surgeries or has had some but not all of the surgeries in the sequence at their age. If there is no prior surgeries, you want to follow the sequence outlined, but if there were some surgeries but not all, the first thing you should do is address the patient's speech and then whatever they are complaining about. Sequence of repairs. The repair outline. Cleft lip, repair this at three to four months. Closure of anterior nasal floor and primary tip rhinoplasty if needed as well. Cleft palate, close this at six to 12 months. Secondary rhinoplasty, so revisionary at five to six years, and focus on reshaping the ala. Definitive, so this surgery is on bones and septum, so it needs to be once the nose has fully grown at 12 to 14 years. Or, if need maxillary mandibular orthognathics, then wait until after the jaw surgery. Alveolar bone graft, this is at seven to eight years. 
palatal expansion at the time of transitional dentition. During eruption of the canine, this promotes bone growth in the bone graft site due to the actively erupting canine. If bone graft too late, it will not have sufficient bone stock for root of the canine and tooth may be lost. With this determines amount of graft. Orthognathic surgery, Lafort 1 is usually performed at time of skeletal maturity, 16 for girls and 18 for boys. If greater than one centimeter, you either need a BSSO or distraction osteogenesis. With this, you can gain one millimeter per day and then two to three week consolidation period without advancement. Refreshing cephalometrics is advised right before the test as there is usually one or two questions on cephalometrics and sometimes it is about a cleft patient. So we will quickly do a review of this in the rapid review episode, so stay tuned. So when you're repairing a cleft lip, it's important to know the common stigmata of different repair types. You're going to be asked whether you see the type of repair or asked a question about if you do one of these repairs, what is the most likely aesthetic outcome? So for rotational advancements, you end up with a short lip. For a triangular flap or a Tennyson flap, you end up with an elongated lip. With a straight line repair, you end up blunting the cupid's box. And a bilateral repair, you end up with a wide philtrum. Now there are many ways to repair a cleft lip or a cleft palate, but for a cleft palate, your goal is to achieve a durable three-layer closure, nasal mucosa, muscle, oral mucosa, and this is to prevent fistula. And ideally, you reposition the levator muscles to a new posterior location, which is their normal position. This allows adequate velar elevation during speech and swallowing. So now, how do we determine if we did a good job and evaluate the closure for a cleft palate? The golden answer for how to evaluate palatal motion and also assess velopharyngeal competency is nasoendoscopy and video-assisted fluoroscopy. This helps show what is moving and how well. You want to see full closure during swallowing and certain speech sounds. You will be told either what is moving well or what is being left open during these tests. When a patient has a velopharyngeal incompetence, or VPI, from here on out, there is a persistent opening from the oropharynx to the nasopharynx. This allows food or liquid to reflux into the nose while swallowing or allows air to escape into the nose causing hypernasal sounds. The two pathologic closure patterns you'll see are coronal and sagittal. First, for coronal. When I hear coronal, I automatically think coronal crown. Crowns are royal and fancy, and what do you wear to a fancy gala? A bow tie. So this means that your vellum is elevating and coming close to or making contact with the posterior pharyngeal wall, but the lateral walls are not moving and you have a bow tie shaped opening. The way to fix this is to bulk up and help add muscle to close these lateral openings. The surgery of choice is a sphincter pharyngeoplasty and you use a palatopharyngeus muscles. The next closure pattern is a sagittal closure pattern. This is the opposite of coronal. It has little to no motion in the AP direction or elevation of the vellum, but the lateral walls are closing. So the treatment for this is a pharyngeal flap. They're usually superiorly based and you raise the mucosa. The superior constrictor muscles, remember the superior constrictor muscles are the muscles you use for a posterior pharyngeal flap. And you include the visceral pretracheal fascia. This is then sewn into the soft palate, creating two lateral ports or openings that allow air to pass through, but are easier to occlude during swallowing and speaking. Some special circumstances you need to know about for VPI is that after TNA or tonsillectomy and adenectomy, in rare cases, a patient can complain of hypernasal speech. This is usually due to an occult submucosal cleft. The patient never had perfect motion for VP closure, but the chronically enlarged tonsils and adenoids that cut down on the motion necessary to separate the oro and nasopharynx. The treatment here would be a palatoplasty. Now, if you get a patient coming to you that had a straight line palatoplasty and they still have VPI and the tests reveal a vaulted palate, then the levator muscles are still inserted too anteriorly and you need to perform a furlough double opposing Z-plasty palatoplasty to correct this. 
As we are talking about VPI, you also need to realize that some of these surgeries can obstruct air movement in patients that already have issues breathing. In those cases, you should screen for OSA or obstructive sleep apnea, and if they are positive, even young patients should be trialed on CPAP. If the patient has OSA and needs surgery for VPI, you should avoid a pharyngeal flap as this occludes more of the airway than other interventions. All right, and now a few quick fire random topics to help you scrape together a few extra points. So Morgan, what does NAM do? The NAM repositions and approximates the alveolar segments and reshapes the nasal cartilage. So in, in patients with a unilateral cleft lip, what type of changes will you see in the nose? The columellar base is shifted to the non-cleft side. The cleft side alar base is posterior. The non-cleft alar base is further from midline. The cleft side piriform margin is further posterior and the angle between the medial and lateral crura are wider on the cleft side. What are the most common dental anomalies you see with patients with clefts? The most common dental anomaly is tooth agenesis, and this is the lateral incisor on the cleft side. The second most common is supernumerary teeth. When there is absent teeth in the cleft, bone graft, and mixed dentition, then implant, likely lateral incisor or canine. A quick thing to touch on is in patients with cleft lip and palate who need orthognathic surgery, if they have a hypoplastic maxilla, but they only have five millimeters of alveolar cleft bone stock, you need to understand that in able to implant a tooth or a put an implant in, you need 10 to 15 millimeters of bone. So the five millimeters is then enough. So instead of a traditional Lafort 1 one piece, you do a two piece Lafort 1, and at that time you can close the alveolar cleft and correct their occlusion while bringing the teeth in and closing that cleft. Lastly, Morgan, real quick, with Lafort 1s, with the Lafort 1 advancement surgery, what type of changes do you see in the patient's mid face? A Lafort 1, you will see increased mid-facial projection and fullness, increased upper lip vermilion fullness, decreased upper lip height, decreased depth of the nasolabial folds, increased tooth show in repose and smile, increased alar base width, and increased nasolabial angle. Thank you so much, Morgan. This is a lot of information in a short amount of time. Thanks, Casey. It was fun. Once again, cleft lip and palate are very intricate topics with many nuanced surgical procedures and treatment pathways, but this was meant to be an overview of the high yield topics. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you like our podcast, subscribe, rate, and leave a comment. Check out our Facebook page. Check out our YouTube channel for all of the amazing videos that we've put together to go along with these presentations. And check out our Instagram at The Loop Podcast for more content, quizzes, and to get in the loop.